You know, I like, I like jokes, but I don't like jokes that put down people like people who are blonde or brunette or whatever, or people of ethnic origin or any kinds of jokes like that I don't really appreciate. There's one kind of joke that I, I do appreciate. It's really not a joke in some ways. It's uh, true stories about people who are very intelligent but have very little common sense. You know anybody like that? You know anybody like that? I have a niece and a nephew, and I'm not going to name names because who knows? <laughs> a niece and a nephew, and they, there were times when you wondered about them because of their common sense. My, my niece, uh, she went by the name Stein for a long time because she asked so many questions that were just everybody should know the answer to. And so her, her brother would always call her Stein when she said something that uh, is pretty, everybody would know. Well, this uh, niece of mine, I guess I'll name her, Katie, she, she has a, a daughter who just took driver's ed, finished driver's ed, and I don't know if they do this everywhere anymore, but to get her license, she had to drive with a police officer. Do they still do that? No. Well, they didn't. This is a gross, gross eel. And they do it in gross eel. So she drove with a police officer. She came home in tears after driving. And, and her mom said, what happened? Well, I didn't get my permit. I failed. I have to take... I have to take, well, my license, I failed because I went five, min, five miles over the speed limit. And her mother said, well, wh why did you do that? Well, Mom, you told me I could drive five miles over the speed limit. <laughs> and her mother said, well, not when a policeman's with you. <laughs> well, my, my nephew, Tom, Tommy, goes by. He and his wife are both chemical engineers. They went to Purdue, which is a very auspicious place to go for engineering. And they live in around Houston, Texas, in Friendswood. Christy works in a petro petroleum uh, install, you know, a factory or whatever you want to call it. And my and Tommy works in the petroleum industry as well. Well, they were up north. My mother-in-law has a cottage up there on Long Lake near Hale, Michigan. And they're up there, and there was this uh, container of what used to be what we thought was gasoline, but it kind of smells like, smelled like turpentine to me. They got their heads together, and they are kind of going over the, uh, the ingredients in this can of what they thought was gasoline. And they decided they would put it in their car. And so they put it in their car. Grand, their grandma told her, don't do this, don't do this. But they did it anyway. They started to go to Tennessee on their way back to Texas. And along the way, they could only go about 55 miles an hour. By the time they got to Tennessee, they made it to Tennessee. Their car just died. And they had to get it towed to a, a dealership. Dealership uh, said, you know, this is going to take a few days for us to figure out what's going on and get the parts in it. So they had to stay in Tennessee for a few days. And so when, when they got the call that they could come and pick up their car, they said, I, we just don't understand what happened here. Because all the plastic parts just melted. Well, they never told them. They said, well, it's good that your car is under warranty. Well, Tommy never said, well, I put this stuff in my, my tank, but that's what caused, caused the problem. Talk about common sense, you know. <laughs> you dispose of that properly. You don't put it in your car. Well, there's a certain young lady who calls her boyfriend and says, please come over here and help me. I have a jigsaw puzzle, and I can't figure out how to get, how to get it started. His, her boyfriend asks, what is it supposed to be when it's finished? And the young lady says, according to the picture on the box, it's a tiger. And her boyfriend decides to stop by and help her with the puzzle. And she shows him 
where she put all the puzzle pieces on the table and he studies the pieces for a moment and then he looks at the box and then he turns to her and says, first of all, first of all, no matter what we do, we're not going to be able to assemble these pieces in, in, into anything that resembles a tiger. He takes her hand and says, second, I'd advise you to relax. Let's have a cup of coffee. And then he sighed, said, he sighed and said, let's put all of these sugar frosted flakes back into the box. <laughs> We're going to talk about puzzles today. And that's appropriate because I believe, I believe that life itself is a puzzle, isn't it? Relationships are a puzzle. Even faith is puzzling if it's a mature faith. Even the most expert puzzle fans know that it's much easier to put together a puzzle if you first look at the picture on the box. Remember they came out with one time a puzzle that was all black? Remember that? Anybody remember? I don't know how you put a puzzle together like that, but they, they, they had one like that. The picture on the front of the box is our guide to helping make sense of all those puzzle pieces that need to be put together. If someone handed you a box of pieces that you'd drive yourself crazy trying to figure it out if you didn't have that picture, that picture to help you put the pieces together. But with the picture as a guide, you have a fighting chance to make something sensible, even beautiful, out of all those pieces. Some of you remember an old story that preachers used to tell about a little boy who was bothering his father while his father was reading a magazine. And the father decided to occupy the little boy by t tearing out a page out of a magazine and then cutting it all up so that he could put the pieces back together. He thought, wow, you know, this is going to take quite a while for him to figure this out. But in a short time, the boy had reassemb reassembled all the pieces and he brought it to his father. The father asked, how did you do it so quickly? And the boy replied, it, it was easy. There was a picture of a man on the other side. And when I got the man right, explained the boy, everything else fall, fell into place. It's an old story, but it's an important, important one, especially when we come to the Gospel of John. The author of John's Gospel has seen the picture on the other side of the piece of paper, and it's a picture of Jesus. Life is no longer a random, meaningless jumble of pieces anymore. God has revealed himself through Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the message of the book of John. John opens his gospel with this declaration about Jesus. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. Two chapters later, he records Jesus' encounter with an elderly Pharisee named Nicodemus. And when Nicodemus is slow to comprehend how an old man can experience a second birth, Jesus blows him away with this promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John has seen the big picture, and he can't stop talking about it. He has found the key to life. If you want to know the purpose of life, look to Jesus. Amen? Amen. In today's lesson, John is writing about a time in Jesus' ministry when the crowds are starting to, to fade away, and Jesus' teachings were too hard. They challenge too many preconceived notions about faith and meaning. His ministry, which had once seemed so promising, was in trouble, and Jesus understood 
what was happening. He turned to the 12 who had been with him from the very beginning, and he said to them, you do not want to leave too, do you? And it was that irrepressible disciple, Simon Peter, who answered with one of the most beautiful statements in the scriptures, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe, and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Simon Peter knew, as, as did John, that Jesus is the picture on the box. He is the key to the puzzle of life. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. A small boat takes its way across the angry uh, waters of the Mediterranean Sea, and on board is a Christian woman named Monica, and tossed about by the waves, the experienced crew seeks to calm the fears of the passengers, but they are fearful themselves, and Monica goes to, to the crew and assures them that they will be okay, that everything will be okay, because she is a Christian, and she believes that God is with them and will see them through this. Monica's son, Augustine, faced his own stormy seas at his home in Italy, awaiting his mother's arrival from Africa. Augustine was in a dangerous state of depression. What he was depressed about was his own search for meaning. We've all gone through those, that search for meaning. Maybe it starts out early in life, but by the time we're in our 40s or 50s, we ask ourselves those questions about our life and its meaning. And then when we move on in later in life, we wonder, does my life have any, have any meaning? My mother-in-law has said that to me. She's 95 years old. She said, why do I keep on living when I have no meaning? We try to reassure, reassure her that she does, that she's an important part of the, our family, and she would be missed, but she yearns. She yearns for the days when there will be no pain or suffering anymore. So we all go through times when we, we wonder about the meaning of our lives. Augustine was born in 354 in a Roman, Roman province in North Africa. His father was a Roman pagan. His mother was a Christian, an avid reader, and a long, lifelong student. Augustine poured over the various philosophical teachings of his day in a vain attempt to understand good and evil, sin and virtue, heaven and hell. And he tried it all. In his own words, as a youth, he, quote, ran wild in the shadowy jungle of erotic adventures, end of quote. Augustine had been raised in the church, but he found the old Latin version of the Bible uninviting. And, and so he explored other avenues of truth. But each of these he discarded as inadequate. And then one day his mother, Monica, introduced him to the teachings of Ambrose, a Christian bishop whom he grew to respect deeply and in the summer of 386 A.D., Augustine was in a garden waging another battle, a spiritual battle with himself. He felt so trapped by the sins of his past that he broke down in tears. He heard the voice of a child chanting, pick up and read, pick up and read. And he felt this to be the voice of God. And so he found his Bible and he opened it and he read, and I want to read this to you. He read these words. Let's behave appropriately as people who live in the day, not in party, partying and getting drunk, not in sleeping around and obscene behavior, not in fighting and obsession. Instead, dress yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't plan to indulge your selfish desires. That's in Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. 
he writes, I neither wished nor needed to read further. Augustine would write of his conversion. At once, he continues with the last words of this sentence, it was as if light of relief from all anxiety flooded into my heart. All the shadows of doubt were dispelled. And the following Easter, Augustine was baptized and his mother Monica lived to see her son's conversion. She died a few, few years later, her prayer answered. Augustine embraced Christ with such a passion that he eventually was ordained and later became a bishop. And his writings have had an enormous impact on Western thought. Augustine discovered what Simon Peter discovered. The key to the puzzle of life is Christ. The key to the puzzle of life is Christ. Millions of people of every walk of life have discovered this truth. The picture on the box is Jesus. When, you, when will you and I discover that truth for ourselves? You know, there are many diverse philosophies in the world today, and some of them are quite bizarre. In Newsweek magazine many years ago, there was a article called Spirituality in America. And the author of the lead article makes the point that more and more people today are creating their own religions out of a mix of orthodox and non-traditional practices and beliefs. Among the many people quoted in this central article was a young woman, a student getting her doctorate in religion and nature at the University of Florida. And the article's author noted that this young woman's idea of worship consists of, and I quote, composting, recycling, and daily five-mile runs. I hope that works for her, I really do. But I have my doubts. From all the evidence I've seen, there is no alternative faith that offers anything that is even close to the power of the words of Jesus. Simon Peter turned to the master and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And this is why, this is why we have gathered here on this day. We haven't come because, well, that's our tr tradition. Well, maybe a little bit. We haven't come to see our friends. Well, yeah, I know. We haven't come because we enjoy the music. We do enjoy the music, but is that the central reason why we come? All of these are important. However, if any of these are the one critical reason why you're here today, you are probably not going to have a truly uplifting experience. Such reasons for worship in G.K. Chesterton's words reveal that our religion is, quote, a more, more a theory than a love affair. I hope you are here today because you have a love affair with God. That's why I'm here today. Because I have a love affair with God. I hope you are here because you have found that Christ has the words of not just eternal life, but of life. Living life abundantly, here and now, as well as eternally. Christ is the one who forgives our sins and washes away our guilt and regrets and helps us to move on with living. When I was about, I want to say 12 years old, I had a, a, a sister who had cystic fibrosis. She died when she was four. And during those four years that she was alive, there were times when I would take care of her and there were times when I would take her places. And the last place I remember taking her was trick-or-treating on Halloween. Couldn't go to many doors, I had to carry her because she couldn't breathe very well anymore. 
That was the last time I saw her. That was the last time I saw her. Because in those days, children couldn't go to the hospital. And she died soon after. But I had guilt and regrets for not spending more time with her. I was just a kid. And I know now I shouldn't have had those regrets and guilt, but I did. And they weighed down on me. And one night, my parents went out, and I was home, and I was kind of just in prayer. And at that moment, I heard a voice say, Bruce, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I am here with you. And I could feel a presence behind me. We don't all have that kind of experience, I know. But as God is there with us, God is here with us. God is with us in the good times and the times that aren't so good. And God helps us see, it, see us through. Malcolm Muggeridge accompanied a film crew to India in order to narrate a documentary on Mother Teresa. He already knew she was a good woman and wouldn't have, she wouldn't, he wouldn't have gone to bother her unless she was. When he met her, he found a good woman who was also so very compelling that he titled his documentary Something Beautiful for God. When he re remarked to Mother Teresa on the fact that she went to Mass every day at 4.30 a.m., she replied, if I didn't meet my master every day, I'd be doing no more than social work. I hope you are here today to meet Christ. I hope you're not here for some other reason. I hope you are here to listen for Christ's words for life, for your life. I hope you are here to have your sins and your guilt and your regrets wa washed away. I hope you find what John and Simon Peter and Augustine and Mother Teresa found. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, Yes, life is a puzzle. But the picture on the box, the picture of Jesus in our hearts and minds leads us to live life fully as you have intended for all of God's children to, to do. So we might ask, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words that bring life and meaning to our soul. May you speak to all those who are present here this morning and bring life to their souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.